great to be with you again today. I love getting together, uh, coming together as a family, gathering, worshiping, opening up God's word. Thank you so much for taking time uh, out of your weekend to just be this church family. God is doing some amazing things, and I hope you're ready to dive back into the book of Daniel together today. You excited to dive in with me again? Hey, there we go. We're in part number two of our four. I'm just going to blow right past that. We're in part number four of our four, uh, part number two of our four week series, The Daniel Dilemma. This is based on, uh, a, a, it's a week by week or verse by verse study of the book of Daniel, but uh, also partially based on some writings of one of my pastors, Pastor Chris Hodges. And I'm just so thankful for his work in, in leading the, the global church and how to answer this question of how do we live godly lives in an ungodly culture. I think it's a really timely conversation. And today, uh, we have kind of a deep topic to dive into today as we talk more about culture. And our, our goal for this series, as we've stated, it has been to learn how to, to stand firm in our faith, to learn how to, to really stand in our faith. But how do we also at the same time love well in a culture that continually compromises? And that's the experience that we're looking to gain from the book of Daniel. The kind of the backstory in the book of Daniel, the entire nation of Israel and Judah were destroyed and its people were, were moved into captivity and slavery. In, in the Babylon culture, it was a completely pagan culture. And we look to these stories, I mean, they're historical accounts. These, are, these aren't just stories, they're historical accounts that we find in the first half, half of the book of Daniel that really talk about how do we live this kind of life? How do we live a godly life? in an ungodly culture. We look to these stories because we see Daniel and his group of friends, these guys that we learned about last week, last week uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were really able to do those two things well, to stand firm in their beliefs but still love well in a culture that continually shifted around them. Last week, we talked a lot about that. How do we do those two things well? We talked that it was really completely possible to do those two things well in balance, stand firm, and love well. And we, we reaffirmed our conviction as a church family that we were going to pe- be a people to, that learned how to do those well. And we said it this way, that we were going to hold high God's truth, but we were also at the same time going to freely give God's faith. We were going to stand on God's principles. We were going to honor his standards, honor his truth, honor his word, but we were going to just as freely as we received God's grace, we were going to give his grace and his love well, that balance But today, what the conversation is going to be around is really going to be focused on what this ungodly culture looks like. And I'm not talking about specifics. I'm not going to be talking about patterns of behaviors. I'm not going to come up with a list of things that we needed to avoid. What we're going to look at today is kind of the underlying subtext of what ungodly culture looks like. So if we could, I'd love to stand. I'd love to pray over our time together and just allow our hearts and minds to get in alignment with what God would like to do in this room together today. Would you pray with me? Lord, we are so thankful for uh, your spirit of truth and your spirit of grace that's around us this morning. We know how much you love us. We sing these amazing songs as a church, the, the, the global church singing these amazing songs of how great you are and how much you love us. And Lord, we know that you've got standards that you're unwilling to compromise. And so what we need your help to do is we need you to be speaking to our hearts. We need you to be speaking to our spirits so that you're the loudest voice in the room. Will you align us, body, mind, soul, and spirit with what you're doing, with who you are? Will you show us just a little bit more of your character here this morning? I pray that in your name. Everyone said amen? Amen. Boy, I said that really poorly just then. Wow, it's going to be a great day. Hey, you sat down with like, without high-fiving or fist-bumping, just one person, just one person right by you. We got a lot of ground to cover today. We got a lot of ground to cover. There we go. I'll take these down here in front. Here we go. Here we go. I'll, I'll give you a hug, you bet. There you go. Yes. There we go. Good job. I love you guys. Well, let's have a conversation about culture, shall we? Um, I think it's really important as, as we talk about culture that as, as Christ followers, we really, have, we've, we really have kind of a distinct choice. And it's this, we're either going to set culture or culture will set us. We'll reflect culture. We're either going to set culture or we're going to reflect culture. We're either going to have an impact, we're going to have an influence on those that are around us, or we're going to be changed and we're going to be affected 
by culture. Maybe I'll put it this way so it makes a little bit more sense. It's kind of the difference between a thermometer and a thermostat. Each has a particular job, don't they? The thermostat does the work of setting the temperature in your home, but the thermometer that's attached to it just has a reading. It's affected by the temperature, isn't it? So as Christ followers, we're going to be in one of those two camps. We're either going to set culture or we're going to reflect culture. And I believe our call as Christ followers is to have an impact here on earth. It's actually to, to help set culture. I don't think we need to retreat away from culture because we're called to make a difference. That's part of our calling as Christ followers is to make a difference in this world. His very last night on earth, Jesus actually talked about this with his disciples. That the, this amazing scene of the Last Supper where he's kind of imparting these last words of encouragement and wisdom and challenge for his disciples. He said this, John recorded it in his gospel in chapter 17, verses 15 and 16. This is a prayer that Jesus is praying to the Father. He says, I've given them your word, and the world hates them because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. This is a key phrase. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one. And I think we can learn from this that our prayers and our focus and the way that we live our lives shouldn't lead us to a place of isolation away from culture. The walk of Christ followers isn't retreating and isolating back into our homes. Or maybe even say it this way, it's not about just coming to this place on Sunday mornings and letting our, our Christianity, letting our faith thrive in this room, but outside of these walls, it has little or no impact on anyone else around us. It's not retreating so that we're safe and sound in this little Christian subculture bubble. That's not who we're called to be. Jesus wants us in the world just like he was in the world. But he prayed we'd be protected from our spiritual enemy. And that's the dilemma, isn't it? We even, just, even just talking that about that, kind of, we feel this tension inside of us. How do we live in the world but not be of it? How do we not have culture change our identity, but rather, how do we have an influence and an impact on culture and the people that are around us? And that's the overwhelming question that we face is we try to walk this faith thing out in a God-honoring way and can I say it this way, in an ever-increasingly ungodly culture. We feel that divide happening almost every day, don't we? So today, I'll use the kind of the phrase we used last week. Today, we're going to expose the playbook of what drives ungodly culture. And I'll say it this way. It's rooted in a mindset. It's called the Babylon mindset. That's the title of our message today. The events in the book of Daniel actually happen in a geographic location called Babylon. If you were going to look at a map of, of ancient Babylon, you'd basically look at the region that's modern-day Iraq. So I've, we've all got kind of the, the geographic picture in our head right now. But our big thought for today is actually this. Babylon's not merely just a location. It's a mindset. Babylon's just not, not just a location for today. It's a mindset. It's a spirit. It's a spirit that's actually existed in the world from the very beginning of Scripture, and it's woven throughout the entire story of Scripture, right up until the very end. And it's a spirit that actually exists in the world today. So we're going to learn this page out of the playbook so that we can see how our spiritual enemy operates around us, so that we can stand firm, that we can protect ourselves, so we can see the attacks of our spiritual enemy coming as we watch culture shift. Sound good? That's where we're going today. So here's the kind of the first reality. The reality of the playbook is this. Satan's very first words in scripture were lies. The very first thing that we see Satan say in scripture are lies. Satan's lies. That's what he does. All the way back at the very beginning of the story, in just the second chapter of the, of the Bible, the first words we see Satan speak to humanity are lies. Here we have Adam and Eve living in perfect harmony and perfect relationship with God, living in the Garden of Eden. All they know is perfect relationship with God. That's actually what they were created to have. They were created to have perfect relationship with God. And Satan shows up in the form of the serpent, and the very first thing he does is he questions God and he elevates people. 
Right in that very first moment, he questions God and he elevates people. He twists the focus away from God and gets Adam and Eve to put the focus on themselves. Remember the question, did God really say, well, if you actually eat that fruit, you'll be just like God. He twists what God says. He elevates man and he diminishes God. His lie is basically this. If you follow me, Satan's lie is if you follow me, if you believe me, if you'll only just trust me, well, I'm, I'm all about you. I'm for you. I'm your friend. All I want is what's best for you. I'll give you whatever you want and you will feel good. If you follow me, if only you'll follow me. But he downplays God. He diminishes God. And he says God is only about himself. That's the lie. That's the lie right there. And that's the biggest lie that the enemy will tell you is that God is only concerned with himself, that he's self-absorbed, that by his very nature he's angry and he's jealous, and that all he wants to do is punish you. Satan's lie is that God is against you. He wants to punish you for your sins, and it's a complete lie. Satan shifts the focus away from God and gets humanity. He gets us to focus on ourselves. If you'll only believe me, if you flip forward just a few pages in your Bible from Genesis chapter 2 and flip up to Genesis chapter 11, there's a story that uh, we teach in Sunday school. Many of us grew up knowing this story, and it's this amazing scene that happens for humanity at this place called Babel. We find the story of the Tower of Babel. Mankind thought so much about themselves. They were so impressed with their accomplishments and who they were. They were so impressed with themselves that they decided that they, they were going to be like gods and they were going to build themselves a tower to reach all the way to the heavens. Look at Genesis chapter 11, verse 4. They said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches the heavens so that we can make a name for ourselves. Their attitude, the attitude of culture was completely focused on selves. We don't need God. We don't need God in heaven. We can build ourselves a tower and get there ourselves. Let's make ourselves great. Let's build a tower. I love that. That was awesome. What we see is Satan's playbook exposed for what it is. Getting people focused on self and not God. He knows that if he can just get, to, just get us to do that, if just to get ourselves to stop thinking or living in a way that's focused on God and get us focused on ourselves, he'll win. He'll win. We'll be out of the game and he won't need to worry about us anymore because we will not make an impact. God takes a look down at humanity and he sees them building this tower and... Because of their hubris, let's take a look at what happens. Look at this. Because of their hubris and focuses on self, God actually scatters their languages. He confuses their language. Look at verse 9. That's why this place was called Babel. Because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. The, actually, the, the Hebrew word for confusion sounds just like Babylon. Confusion. That's what was introduced to the world, was confusion. Confusion. Sin brought this confusing mindset to the world. It introduced confusion that separated man away from God's standards. I'd say it even this way. Living by any other standard than, other than God's produces a confusion in our lives. There's a chaos that happens in us. And can I say it this way? There's a chaos that happens in culture whenever it follows any other path than God's. We see it. We feel it. We see it in culture. We know we experience it in our, in our own lives because we've all been there. We've all been in that chaotic, confused place. We see this confusion and chaos demonstrated in the news, whether it's a, it's a mass shooting that happens or it's racial tensions or it's, can I say it this way, it's rapidly declining moral standards. I'm not talking about specific sins or things. I'm talking about a, it's a heart confusion 
Because when culture shifts the focus away from God and starts elevating self, it's a confused way of thinking that leads to decline. It leads to chaos. And so it's why as Christ followers that we profess that we have this need. We need God. We need God. We need to recognize his authority in our lives. Culture set God aside and moved on. But we know that God wants to be involved in our lives. God wants to be involved in your life. He wants to be first. He does. He wants to be first in our lives. He wants to be our first priority in life. Not because he's selfish or insecure or needy. That's our spiritual enemy. That's our own broken mindset, putting characteristics of an unholy, unrighteous God back onto him. It's not because he's insecure or selfish or needy. It's just because he wants the very best for people. He wants to be involved. He wants to heal. He wants to redeem. He wants to provide. He wants to reconcile people. And this is why we talked about these two words last week. It's why we don't give in to moral relativism. The danger of moral, to, moral relativism is confusion. As Christ followers, we allow God to set the standards for culture, for how we're going to live. Moral relativism allows culture to define God's standards. We don't allow culture to redefine truth. We don't allow culture to redefine standards. We hold high God's truth and God's standards. And this same spirit of confusion, this same Babylon mentality is woven all throughout Scripture, even up to the very last books of the Bible. All the way back in the book of Revelation, there's prophecy about the end time that's going to come. And we find there's two chapters specifically in the book of Revelation that's going to happen to the spirit of Babylon. The header in your Bible, if you flipped over to Revelation chapters 17 and 18, just reads, the fall of Babylon. It's judgment that's going to happen. End time judgment we see in scripture for God's judgment against this Babylon mindset. Look at Revelation 17, 5. A mysterious name was written on her forehead, the spirit of Babylon personified in the form of this, of this woman. Babylon the great, mother of all prostitutes and obscenities in the world. What does that even mean? Everything that we see in the world that is sinful and evil and wicked has its roots based in this Babylon mentality, this Babylon mindset. We have to understand the moment we get our eyes off of God and onto self, the moment we get distracted and we look away from God and take a look at ourselves, as soon as we elevate ourselves and we diminish God, we fall victim to this mindset. We're not immune from it. And actually, when you read through the book of Revelation, there's warnings given to the church as a whole about what can happen if we give in to this mindset. And even if you flipped back to the very middle of Scripture, you can read more about the fall of Babylon, the judgment that's going to happen to this mindset. Isaiah 47, verses 8 and 10. Now listen. You lover of pleasure, lounging in your security and saying to yourself, look at these words, I am and there is none beside me. Now then, listen, you lover of pleasure, lounging in your security and saying to yourself, I am and there is none beside me. We hear, can even just hear the echoes of culture in those two lines, can't we? Lover of pleasure, we're all about ourselves. We have this sinful desire, this craving because of our sinful nature that we have to try and fill. Lounging in your security, it's really self-security, self-reliance. Don't worry if there even is a God, I've got this. Isaiah goes on, I will never be a widow or suffer the loss of children. These are, it's, it's, it's quoting this spirit of Babylon here in this moment. I will never be a widow or suffer the loss of children. And the phrase comes, both of these will overtake you in a moment on a single day. Loss of children and widowhood. They will come upon you in full measure. 
In spite of your many sorceries and all your potent spells, you have trusted in your wickedness and have said, no one sees me. Your wisdom and knowledge mislead you when you say to yourself, I am, and there is none besides me. This mindset, this confusion, this terrible, this terrible thing, it just shifts focus from God to man. It's me, 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 me. Look at me, look at me, look at me. I am, and there is none like me. Right here in these few lines in the Bible, there's a judgment that's coming for those who are lovers of self. This Babylon mindset's gonna cause confusion and chaos. And I think it's probably pretty safe to say that we live in a culture that's all about self. Would you agree? It's all about me. Everything in life is about me, what I want, what I want to accomplish, what I deserve, what I need. I, I, me, me, selfie, selfie. And what we see right here, I think, in Isaiah, in Isaiah 47 is the motto of Babylon. The motto of the Babylon mindset is, I am, and there is none like me. Bask in my glory. That's the Babylon mindset. To elevate self and to lower God. That's just it. The elevation of self, the elevation of humanity, the elevation of our collective awesomeness and lowering God. That's the trick. That's the trick. That's right out of the playbook is the trick, is Babylon elevates self. When what, we wind up, what happens is when we fall to this, we wind up believing the lie that we're smarter than God, we love better than God, and we know how to set the course of humanity better than God. It's self-worship. Look at me, look at me, look at me. It's self-building, self-praising. I can do this without God. I don't need God. If I really need you, I've got the God bat phone in the corner. I'll come calling. But until then, I've got this. It's self-indulging, isn't it? It's self-indulging. I can do whatever I want, and there's no consequences to my behavior. If it feels good, do it. What did we say last week? You do you. Babylon not only elevates self, though, it diminishes God, and that's the sin is it diminishes God. I am, and there is none besides me. I think these words out of Isaiah are absolutely 100% intentional to kind of knock us and rock us and get us to think about this. Intentional words that were meant to mock and steal from God. Can I say it that way? What's the very first phrase? I am. Babylon steals God's name. God's name is I am. Moses encounters him in the middle of the desert. There's a bush that's on fire and it's not burning up. And Moses says, well, when, they tell, when I go and talk to the people and you're going to rescue them, who should I say is calling? I am. We steal from God's name and we apply it to ourselves. The Babylon mentality steals God's name and gives it to itself. I am, and there is none besides me. And God, not out of jealousy, not out of spite, not, a, not out of any negative kind of human thought, says, no, 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 my name is I am. I am the I am. We get this confused and we get this mixed up. We believe lies about the nature and character of God. We believe the lie that God doesn't love me. If he did, if God truly loved me, he'd leave me alone and just let me be who I am. The truth is, is that God loves you so much, he sent his son to forgive you when we, when, we, when you didn't deserve it. Or we believe the lie that God isn't for you. That he's mean, that he's hateful, he's spiteful, he's outdated. That he doesn't have a place in the world nor a place in my life. It's the lie that makes us think we know more and know better than God does. 
Or maybe you hear yourself in this one, that we believe the lie that God wants too much from us. No, no, following you, you're asking too much from me. You're asking me to leave things behind that I love to follow you. That's, that, it's too much. It's too high a price. But the reality is, is that God loves you so much, he will love you unconditionally in the moment that you find him. But he loves you too much to leave you in that spot. He loves you too much to leave you to your sinful desires. This is the Babylon mindset, to elevate self and to lower God. And it's the common theme for humanity's side of the story that's woven throughout Scripture. And there's, this found, there's a foundational story here in the book of Daniel that shows us this. Daniel chapter 4, verse 4, we see Nebuchadnezzar says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at home in my palace, contented and prosperous. Do you hear it? The I am. He's self-indulgent. He's self-righteous. I did this. I, Nebuchadnezzar, made this happen. And he has this dream that troubles him. It rocks him to his very core. A dream about a tree that grew and covered the entire nation of Babylon. It was lush. It was beautiful. It spread out over the entirety of the, company, uh, the country, but it was cut down. And only the stump was left behind. And Nebuchadnezzar calls all of his sorcerers, all of his wise men, all the people who are in the know. And they couldn't and they wouldn't interpret Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And at the very end of chapter one, where we were last week, is Daniel and uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Actually, we're going to start calling them Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. We're going to call them by their real names. Go watch last week if you missed it. Daniel's actually given the gift of interpretation of dreams by God for standing firm in his beliefs. It's an awesome spot at the very end of chapter one. So Daniel gets called to the king because he learns that Daniel has this ability to interpret dreams. And Daniel doesn't cave into the pressure because these other sorcerers and uh, wise men and wizards and whoever else they are, they know that if they interpret Nebuchadnezzar's dream wrongly, He's going to execute him because he's off his rocker. Daniel doesn't cave to the pressure of standing before the king. For a time, he's nervous. He's perplexed. It actually says a few words to that effect there in chapter 4. But then he steps up and he lovingly delivers truth about this dream to Nebuchadnezzar. And he says in, in verse 22, he says, Your majesty, you are the tree. You're the tree that grows up and gets cut down at the stump. In your dream, verses 25 and 26, you will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox and be drenched with the dew of heaven. What's Daniel saying? Y'all going to make you lose your mind. <laughs> Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar is going to go nuts. That's the interpretation of the dream. That takes some chutzpah. I'll say it that way. I know, I just kind of got knocked down a few pegs in your books, but that's all right. <laughs> King Nebuchadnezzar, you are going to lose your mind. This statement of I am and there is none beside me is a confused and a disturbed mindset. Daniel goes on seven times, and what he means by that is seven years. Seven years will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all the kingdoms of the earth, and he gives them to anyone he wishes. The command to leave the stump of the tree with its roots means that your kingdom will be restored to you when you acknowledge that heaven rules. And I think that's a beautiful thing, a beautiful picture of learning about God's discipline and his care for you. He may discipline you, but there's always a stump that's left behind. The roots stay and bring new life and restoration. But you can have this, Nebuchadnezzar, when you acknowledge that heaven rules. We have to flip the mindset, don't we? The Babylon mindset elevates self. It elevates man and diminishes God. But we have to flip the mindset. So what happened to Nebuchadnezzar? Oh, he repented and turned his ways and he was just fine. Nope. Verse 28, all this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. 
12 months later, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said, is this not the great Babylon that I have built? Is not this the great Babylon that I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? I am, and there is none beside me. And in verse 33, everything that was said about Nebuchadnezzar came true. He spent seven years as the crazy hermit living out in the wild. But watch what happens to him. He goes on, verse 34, At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes towards heaven, and my sanity was restored. Simply looking towards heaven, acknowledging heaven, acknowledging God, it broke the power of this confusion mindset in the king. It broke the spirit of confusion and it brought his sanity back. Watch his response. Listen, listen to the, his response here for the shift in mindset as we keep going through here in chapter 4. These are verses 34 through 37. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal d- dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All of the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the power of heaven and peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? At that time, my sanity was restored. My honor and splendor were returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. Isn't that an interesting phrase right there? My advisors and nobles sought me out and I was restored to my throne and became even greater than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the king of heaven because everything he does is right and all his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble how did the mind shift, mindset shift? How did he flip the script? No longer focused on I am. No longer focused on self. Instead, focus, attention, and honor shifted to God. Not I am, but he is. That's the shift in the Babylon mindset. Instead of following culture's mindset to elevate self and lower God, his mindset was restored by shifting to elevating God and lowering self. So to guard against the Babylon mindset, here's three declarations. Maybe say it this way. There's three I will statements. How we're going to impact culture. How are we going to impact and influence and how are we even going to navigate ungodly culture? Here's how we're going to do this. Here's how we're going to elevate God and lower self. The very first one, we're going to exalt God. We will exalt God. We're going to honor God with a lifestyle of worship. Not just living for God in this awesome hour on Sunday mornings, or when I feel like it. No, it's living out a life of praising and exalting God. It's out loud, everyday life, lifestyle, worship of God. We're going to let this faith life, this Christ-following life, get outside of these walls and outside of this skin to impact those that are around us. Everything about culture is about exalting self, so we're going to be defined by the exaltation of God. We're going to elevate God and lower self. Unashamed, out loud worship, not because of anything we've done or anything we've accomplished that we've built or we've sung or we've achieved or we've bought, but living out loud lives of worship to God because he bought us, he saved us, he cleaned us up, and we're completely different because of it. Psalm 145 verses 1 and 2. I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. We exalt God, not ourselves. We elevate God, not ourselves. And we're completely different when we do that. We get in alignment. 
He put honoring God above all other things. And I guarantee that when we do that, everything else in life will start to fall in its correct place. It doesn't mean that everything in life will be easy, but it does mean that our priorities will be correct when we do. So we will exalt God. We will also acknowledge God. Can we be a people who just simply are defined that we're going to honor God with lifestyle dependence on him? What did Nebuchadnezzar say to God? Your ways are true and your ways are just. Acknowledging God is simply acknowledging, recognizing his authority. Your ways are right and your word is truth. So no matter what culture says, we're not going to adjust to what culture does. We're going to stand firm in what your word says. We're going to hold high God's truth. We're not going to allow ourselves to be subjected to the confusion as culture shifts and changes. Instead, we acknowledge God and our dependence on him to lead us. It's a phrase of scripture that many of us know so well. Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6. Trust, have faith, have confidence. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. So many of us, our story sounds like, but for the grace of God, here I stand. We don't stand on our own merit. We, we know we're not perfect. I hope you know you're not perfect. We depend on God. We trust in him. We know that we need him. So instead of puffing ourselves up or elevating self and diminishing God, we acknowledge him and we allow him to lead us. Culture can say what it wants about us. But we acknowledge that it all came from God. And the third one I think is a key, is that we will humble ourselves. We're going to honor God with lifestyle submission, God's ways, not our ways. We're not going to wait for those moments where God has to humble us. Those may come. Those may come. But we're going to choose to bend our knee to our Lord and Savior. What did King Nebuchadnezzar say when his sanity was restored? And those who walk in pride, he is able to to humble. The path of following God and not being changed by culture is marked by a lifestyle of humility toward God. Humility is coming. You can initiate it yourself or you can let God initiate it. James 4.10, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. 1 Peter 5, 5 and 6. And all of you, dress yourselves in humility as you relate to one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So humble yourselves under the mighty power of God, and at the right time, he will lift you up in honor. Humility is the posture of a Christ follower. It's choosing to live under God's mindset and not living under culture's mindset. And we have to make this choice. Are we going to elevate God or are we going to elevate self? That's our daily choice. Every day, am I going to elevate God or am I going to elevate self? The confusion, the carelessness, the strife, and the pain that we see in the world so often, I believe, is a direct result of this twisted, humanity-centered view of life. That's the Babylon mindset. But we counter this by living in humility toward God and it results in peace, not confusion. Living in, huma in humility toward God brings peace, not confusion. We humble ourselves at the right time and God lifts us up. He doesn't keep us down, he builds us up. Confusion would say that living in humility means thinking less of yourself. It's the thought that brings us down. You're no good. You're damaged. You're marked. You'll never amount to anything. But humility is just thinking of ourselves less, elevating God and lowering self. So what will we do? We will exalt God this lifestyle of worship. We will acknowledge God, this lifestyle of dependence. 
And we will humble ourselves. It's a lifestyle of submission. I think it this way. Standing firm in a self-inflated, a pride-inflated culture begins face down. It begins face down. And so I'd like to invite you to stand. We're going to take a few moments and, and worship together. Kristen's going to lead us in a song. And I think this is a really appropriate morning for you to just have a response. A worshipful response to God. How are we going to live this lifestyle of worship, dependence, and submission toward God? And so we're going to sing. We're going to bring the lights down and just have this moment. And this moment is between you and the Lord. And maybe it's a moment where you need to come down and you just need to recognize, Lord, I've been a little stiff-necked. I've been a little prideful. I've done a little too much of elevating self and lowering you. And so in this moment right here at Almost 1120 on Sunday morning, January 13th, I'm making the choice to lower myself and to elevate you. Can we worship? Can we just build a foundation of worship in our lives? We're going to elevate God. That's who we are. We're going to hold high God's word. We're going to freely give God's grace. And we're going to elevate God. That's who we are. Kristen, will you lead us this way? Do you hear the difference in those words? Holy, there is no one like you. Not I am, and there is none beside me. Holy, there is no one like you. And so I acknowledge you. I exalt you, and I humble myself. Do you hear the difference in the posture? What kind of people do we want to be known as? There is none like us. We've got it going on. No, there is none like him. Can I tell you what he did in my life? I want to be that, that people. So would you pray with me this morning? Would you even just put your hands out? Just in surrender, in submission. And the beautiful thing about this hands up, hands out posture is that as we surrender, God freely gives And so would you give to God and would you receive from him this morning? Lord, here you see us surrendered, abandoned, humble in this posture of worship and exaltation because holy, there is no one like you. And we want to be a people that's known for you. And so we will, as a posture, we will acknowledge you. Lord, will you help us? Will you lead us into a life of worship, of acknowledging you, of this dependence on you, a dependence on your character? And Lord, we make the choice right now that we will humble ourselves before you. We lift you up and we lower ourselves. And so, Lord, as you meet us here with this gift of submission, this offering of worship, Lord, I pray over each and every one here that you would would bless, that you would draw them close, that you would draw each of us in and you'd show us who you are, that you'd speak your name over us, that you'd speak your life into us, and, Lord, that they would just cause something, this posture of humility and submission to you would just cause something inside of us to affect everyone around us. We want to be a people for you. We want to be a people that's for people as we share the goodness of your grace, as we share the goodness of your truth, as we hold high your word, as we freely give worship and lead lead these lives of worship and surrender before you. Help us break this confusing mindset that's just pervasive in our culture. Help us live differently. And we pray that in your name. Amen. Thank you for being part of Real Life Church this morning. Thank you for honoring God and for worshiping him. Our elders are going to be coming down forward right now. They're going to be down here in the front. We would love to pray with you. If you came to church this morning, 
and there's something that you need to receive, you need some words spoken over you, you need prayer for a need in your life, we'd be honored to stand with you. But if you're here this morning in these words, you're hearing these things for the first time, how much God loves you. There's something drawing you to him. There's something inexplicable that's happening inside you right now. We'd love to talk to you about that because I believe that's God drawing him to yourself, drawing you to himself. We'd love to pray with you with that over this morning. I speak blessing over you. God, keep you, make his face to shine upon you and give you peace this week. God bless you.